Now we have Brian McMahon, who is the uh, Executive Director of the New York State Economic Development Council. He's held that position since January 1st of 2000. Uh, that that uh, organization over represents 900 economic development professionals in New York State. Uh, before this position, he was uh, Director of Economic Development and Manufacturing for the Business Council of New York State. Uh, Brian's from Cornell, Corning, graduated from SUNY Albany, and he lives in uh, Saratoga Springs. Great, thank you. And thank you, EJ, for inviting me. Um, <clears throat> You know, mine, I'll speak from here. I think that was, that was the plan. Um, as I sit here, <clears throat> I've been involved in economic development for about 25 years. It just strikes me how far we, we have come. Uh, when I started in economic development, um, they were just starting regional councils. And today, oh wait, we have regional councils. <laughs> and then they start, and then we created empire zones, kind of tax-free and oh, when we have tax-free New York today, okay, or we're working toward it. So maybe we, uh, what Yogi say, deja vu all over again. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's important to keep that in mind also. Um, I'm going to take my task seriously and respond to the, uh, to the presentations. Um, on, uh, on hydrofracking, um, I think Diana's report is, is very important because it, kind of quantifies what the economic potential is for hydrofracking uh, in New York State should, uh, should we allow it. And I think it's really important because when we do talk about new programs like Tax Free New York or Hotspots or really any new economic development initiative, I mean, we, we really don't know what the outcome is going to be. We can base it on, you know, some, some good research and we think we understand what the outcomes are going to be, but we really don't. We really do understand what the outcomes are going to be with hydrofracking. We really do know that there are going to be hundreds at first and then thousands of very high paying jobs coming into the state that's going to generate uh, millions of dollars for our communities and for, for the state. Um, so I think your report, Diane, is very, very important and will help us uh, articulate what the economic benefits are, but also helps us to articulate what we have already lost, which I think is, uh, is also important. Um, and uh, <clears throat> the message that, that we get, uh, that we receive from our markets, which are uh, corporate real estate executives and site, site location consultants from uh, state or companies generally outside of New York um, about hydrofracking is that it sends just an awful message about our regulatory environment. And that our, and it just confirms in people's mind that we have a hostile regulatory environment. And that is particularly true, by the way, when we talk to manufacturers because they are afraid that if they do a project in New York State that the project will be attacked and opposed by environmental groups um, who are opposing um, hydrofracking. So there are a lot of consequences to not um, authorizing fracking uh, beyond just uh, the impacts on the industry itself. And as Diana mentioned, there are also, if we do approve it, there are going to be a lot of other economic benefits that are going to accrue besides benefits to the core industry. Pennsylvania. Uh, Shell is building a $2 billion ethane cracker facility near Pittsburgh. In Ohio, when they opened up for, uh, for hydrofracking, um, they saw a lot of particularly uh, steel manufacturing businesses invest hundreds of millions of dollars to expand their facilities in order to meet the demand for hydrofracking. In 2009, when oil and gas companies were staging uh, assets in anticipation that uh, they would allow fracking uh, in the southern tier. One of the areas that really benefited most was Shimon. And the staging was, was occurring uh, for two reasons. One, they could access the northern tier uh, um, oil wells uh, from Elmira, but they also were anticipating that at some point in the not too distant future, New York State would approve uh, hydrofracking. During that time, 2009, Shimon County, uh, you heard the bad news from, uh, from EJ. In 2009, things weren't too bad uh, in Elmira and Shimon County. Uh, they had a million square feet of manufacturing and office space. It was developed or renovated by gas industry businesses. They led New York in sales tax growth. They led New York in room tax growth. They led New York in full value growth. 
employments were up 20 percent to an all-time high. Um, so there's an awful lot of activity that was going on in, uh, in, in Elmira in anticipation of hydrofracking. Today, um, fast forward uh, four more years, Chemung County is one of the highest unemployment rates in the state. Elmira is one of only two SMSAs that experienced job loss last year. Sales tax collections year to date are down 7%. Room tax uh, revenue first quarter down 37%. Um, so, you know, is it, is it too late, um, you know, if we do approve it now? Uh, I think if we had approved it four years ago, we'd all be extolling the virtues of hydrofracking as they are in Pennsylvania right now. Uh, our school districts would benefit, um, taxpayers benefit, infrastructure, economic development would benefit. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I can't tell you how often I'm asked the question, am I optimistic? Um, this morning, I am more optimistic maybe than ever, and for one reason, one word, Illinois. If freaking Illinois can approve <laughs> hydrofracking, um, New York State certainly can. Um, I thought one of the most interesting slides EJ had was on the uh, college age bubble. Um, because uh, I think it shows that we're educating an awful lot of people that are going to work in businesses in other states. Um, I wish we could figure out a way to tax them somehow so we could uh, get, get that education paid for. But we are a workforce provider uh, for businesses in other states. And I experienced that um, just a few days ago. Uh, my family and I run a scholarship program in Corning, New York, where I grew up. And we provide two pretty significant uh, scholarships to two graduating seniors who pursue STEM scholars or STEM curriculum in, uh, at New York State colleges or universities. And our first scholarship winner just graduated from RIT this year. Graduated with a degree in mechanical engineering, graduated with a 3.8 uh, uh, grade point average. A week after he graduated, he had five interviews with five companies, and all five companies offered him jobs. Not one of them was from New York. Not one of them. Um, let me just um, kind of add to one of the points that EJ made. One of my favorite factoids, I have three favorite factoids. This is one of my favorites. New York top employers in 1964, uh, A&P, Con Ed, Kodak, GE, G GM, Grumman, IBM, MetLife, New York Tel, Sperry Rand. 2013, nine of the top 20 uh, private sector employers are healthcare systems. Uh, the largest employer in New York State is North Shore, Long Island Jewish. Uh, the next largest employers are Walmart, J.P. Morgan, Wegmans, Verizon, Citigroup, U of R Medical, IBM, New York Presbyterian, Mount Sinai. Um, obviously, you know, th these aren't conclusive as to what's going on in the economy, but they, I think, do support uh, the EJ's um, slide that showed uh, the employment change by industry shifting very significantly from uh, high wage, high value, high multiplier manufacturing jobs to EDS and MEDS, which are either direct or indirect, uh, directly subsidized by, um, uh, by government. Um, so what do we do? Um, you know, if I was going to create a policy to try to attract business and industry, I would look at the factors that drive their decisions. And when we talk to companies and site consultants, there are a number of factors that they look at in evaluating our sites. And each factor might be different for each industry uh, or for uh, a specific company. Just real quickly, I'm going to run through these. Um, overall operating costs, environment, taxes, power, workers' comp, UI, healthcare, labor. They want to know what the cost is going to be on an ongoing basis to operate their, uh, their facility quality and availability of workforce, they want to know. you got to show them where they're going to get the workers. Regulatory environment, are they going to be able to build their facility in a uh, reasonable period of time so they can get up and running? Uh, raw materials, um, access to quality and efficient transportation systems and infrastructure, university R&D partnerships, quality of life. So those are, you can throw in a, a, a few others, but those are basically it. And, you know, I would kind of focus on those and, um, and look at where growth does come from. Uh, when, you, when you read things that groups like at the Edward Lowe Foundation and the Kauffman Foundation, which is run by our keynote speaker, 
uh, for several years, um, you know, they, they say that about 80% of the growth comes from either existing uh, businesses or new and uh, uh, young businesses. Everybody likes the big uh, attraction project. Local and state elected officials love them. They get to use those big scissors and walk in the muddy fields with, uh, put the shovel in the ground. Um, but the state should focus on where the jobs come from. And 80% come from existing businesses or new businesses. So let me just conclude, wrap up real quick uh, by recommending three things the state could do between now and the end of the year that would have a, in my opinion, significant impact on ups the upstate economy. First thing they do is eliminate the corporate income tax on manufacturers. Um, what, a, what a message that would send. Uh, New York's open for manufacturing. Um, and it would be a great compliment to the governor's tax-free New York. I mean, the criticism that we hear from businesses is, what's that going to do for me? Um, this would help a lot. It's not that expensive, $200 million. You could phase it in in, in over a two- to three-year period. Second thing I would do is I would set definitive time frames on seeker decisions. Right now, seeker is uh, open-ended. It can be go on indefinitely. We've seen it with fracking. We've seen it with a number of other projects like St. Lawrence Cement, for example. Um, tell developers, tell companies uh, how long it's going to take. They'd rather have uh, a quick no, believe me, than a long drawn out maybe because it ties up their capital, could be deployed um, elsewhere. Um, and, uh, and fracking. I think if you did those three things uh, in combination with tax-free New York, I think you'd have a pretty robust, pretty strong economic development program for uh, New York State. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs>